All right, hello. <clears throat> Getting a little bit of a late start, but that's all right. We'll make it work. So we are Sarvi Wildlife Care Center. How many of you guys have heard of us before? A handful of you? Well, excuse me, I'm a little bit out of breath. For those of us who are not familiar, for those of you who are not familiar with us, what we do is we take in injured, orphaned, and sick wild animals with the mission to rehabilitate them and release them back out in the wild. So, as cool as it is, wild animals do not make good pets. I mean, it'd be really cool to have, you know, something like, uh, you know, maybe like a fox or a possum or a raccoon or, you know, one of these birds of prey as a pet. But in reality, they don't make good pets at all. A lot of the times, these guys require very specialized care and food. So unless you don't know, unless you know what you're doing, you can hurt the animal, the animal can hurt you, or both. And in some cases, it's actually illegal to have these guys as, uh, as pets. And I'll kind of get into that a little bit later. Now, at Sarvi, uh, as I mentioned, we take in injured orphan animals. And uh, that is our primary goal, to release them back out in the wild. We do not want to keep these guys. However, the birds that we have here today are non-releasable for one reason or another. There is something about them, something about their bodies that prevents them from going into the wild. If we were to let them go, they wouldn't survive for one reason or another. Excuse me. And um, so does anybody here know another name for bird of prey? Raptor. Yes. Not like the ones you see on Jurassic Park, mind you. These guys are more like distant relatives of them. But these guys are modern day raptors. And the word raptor actually comes from a Latin word which means to seize or grab which kind of gives you an idea of how they hunt, because a lot of these guys will usually hunt by using their feet. Now, there's three main things about these guys that actually sets them apart from other types of birds. A lot of people think it's because they eat meat. Well, I mean, if you think about it, robins, they'll eat things like insects and worms. They're not birds of prey. Herons, they eat fish and uh, frogs and stuff like that. They're not birds of prey. There are three main things about these guys that sets them apart. One of them, if you look up at the face, is their beak. They will have that curved upper beak with that sharp hook at the end. And that's what they use for eating their food. Then if you look down at their feet, they will have strong grasping feet, hence the term raptor, and will have sharp talons on them. Some people call them claws, but they're actually called talons. And the third thing, if you look up back up at their face, they will have forward facing eyes. Now, forward-facing eyes gives them what's called depth perception. So, guess what, guys? We're also predators. I know, right? All of us fuzzies are predators, right? A lot of them, anyways. Um, <clears throat> but it allows them to tell exactly how far away something is. A if you're hunting something, you need to be able to tell that so you can grab it. If you think about it, prey items, like you bunnies, or you uh, pigeons, or anything like that, squirrels, those guys will have their eyes on the side of their head because they want to be able to see all around them because they don't want to become lunch, right? And if you think about it, things like grass is not going to run away from them. They don't have to chase grass or seeds or whatever it is they eat. So they want to be able to see everything so they don't become lunch. Now, we're going to start with, is it just going to be you or? So we're going to start with owls, and we're going to go right to the large species. And uh, one thing I'd like to ask from you guys, while the birds are out, do not clap. Sometimes loud noises can kind of uh, startle these guys. So we'd like you to do what's called the sign language clap. So do the jazz hands. There you go. Yes, beautiful. Take that in, uh, and it's live and it's breathing. Yes, this is Chano Wichakte, and she is a great horned owl. Great because she's large in size, horned because she has feathers that resemble horns or ears on the top of her head. 
and owl because she's an owl. Now those ears, the ear tufts, and of course they're not ears and they're not horns, they're just feathers, but those feathers are actually very useful. They can help her with camouflage when she has those up. It looks more like a tree snag or branch or whatever it breaks up the top of her head from the big flat so she blends in better. And their mood indicators, these feathers actually tell you what kind of a mood the owl is in. They communicate with them. You ever see your cat when it's mad? What do the ears do? They go down. Yep. <laughs> right? These guys hiss too. They don't do the snort, but they actually um, can hiss and clack. So she might get a little upset and those ear tufts will go down. So we're going to make her happy. Well, maybe half happy. So that's uh, why they have that name, Great Horn. Now, you notice that the eyes are very large. They're huge. Those eyes are so large, in fact, there's no room in the eye socket for the eyeball to move. Yes, indeedy, they, they do doo-doo. And then they announce it. So those eyeballs actually have a bony ring around them, and it makes it so they can't move their eyeballs. So let's pretend we're humans, keep our heads straight, and just with our eyes look up and down and all around. We can do that. The owl can't. If the owl wants to see something, it has to turn its whole head in order to look at it. And you think, wow. How does it turn its head like that? That neck looks really big and thick, huge. Well, underneath all those feathers, that owl's neck is actually about the size of a man's thumb. It's long and it's narrow. We have seven vertebrae in our neck. They have twice as many. They have 14. So when they turn, you can't really see it because of all those feathers, but it's very capable of moving way more than what we can do. What's that? A lot of the bird, the bulk, bulkiness of the bird is feathers. Remember, birds are made for, for what? Flying. And so everything needs to be as lightweight as possible. And feathers are kind of like an armor. It protects them, and it even does something that you never thought of. Here's something new for everybody to think about. You know when you go out in the sun and you put sunscreen on to protect yourself from the UV uh, rays of the light, you know? Feathers do that for the bird. If they didn't have feathers, they'd probably be a lot more uh, cancers and things on their skins, so. That's kind of a cool thing. And feathers aren't everywhere on the bird. They, they go in tracks. And it's like a comb over. It looks like feathers are everywhere, but they're not. So another thing about the, the uh, great horned owl is their hearing. They have pretty good hearing. Some owls actually will close their eyes the last few feet when they're going down to catch something. They just rely on their hearing. And some of these guys have one ear up here and one ear down here, down here, which seems kind of weird. I mean, just think if we looked like that, it would be kind of odd. But that helps the owl tell exactly how far something is. These guys can tell when animals are under the snow, like several feet, all kinds of situations that 
It's just phenomenal. It's unbelievable. Also, I want you to notice how this owl is perched. So if you guys are recreating your suits, do the feet right. Two toes in front, two toes in back. Now, it's not that they can't swing that one toe. It's just they prefer to do two and two. And it's actually better to hunt that way than three and one, like a lot of the others, hawks and eagles. So, Uh-oh, is that threatening to you? So, <gasps> did you hear the hiss, by the way? Oh, OK. So Chano Wachakte is with us because one of the biggest reasons we get adult owls is they get hit by car. They're sitting there looking for something to eat. They open up, they swoop down, and they're not paying attention. Here comes the car, and the car doesn't even have to hit them. Just the air from the car going by. <laughs> can throw them into a tree or into the ground. And then they end up getting head trauma, eye trauma, broken wings, broken legs, all kinds of things. Chano has an eye injury. There's nothing we can do about that eye. It's permanently fixed in that one position. You know how your eyes dilate, gets big and gets small? This one's right eye. You can see it's getting cloudy now, too. It just stays in the same. So if there's too much light, can't compensate. Too little light, can't compensate. So it's a definitely a problem. And you'll also notice that the wing here kind of sticks out kind of funny. So it also got injured. And there's nothing we can do. We can't just break it and re reattach it or you know, realign it. It's permanently damaged, so she can't see out of one eye and can't fly. So that makes her permanently disabled. Now, we're going to go from owls to hawks. Now it weighs about three pounds. Yes, as Keshul mentioned earlier, they do have extremely thin necks. So if you were to actually put your finger into their feathers, it would go pretty much about two thirds of the way in before you actually hit their neck. So it's all feathers. If you take away the feathers on these birds, they look so much more thinner and scrawny than you would think. <laughs> there you go. Hey guys. So my name is Alistair, and this is Chatong, and this is our red-tailed hawk. And we have red-tailed hawks all over Washington State in the United States. They're really predominant. And you'll see them like uh, near farm fields when you drive down the road and you look up on the telephone poles and such. And Chatong, um, if you look at her, she has this beautiful color. And there's actually three morphologies of these guys. And she has the intermediate morph. So there's a light morph, a dark morph, and a intermediate morph. And um, the colors really don't. Sometimes for birds, colors depend on regions and uh, temperature and such. But there's really no correlation with that. Now, uh, we t call her, you're OK, Chitong. We call her a red-tailed hawk because she has this beautiful red tail. But something that's interesting is that when they are not quite adults in their adolescents, their tails are actually more of a brown color. They have a couple other differences too. So her sear, which is above her beak, that yellow color, when they are young babies, it's more of a bluish gray color. And so, um, you see how Chitong is standing on my glove. She's got three talons in front and one behind, which is just another way that these guys uh, catch their prey, as opposed to um, the great horned owl. And she's got this, this uh, 
yellow, beautiful uh, armor on her, her feet and up her legs. Because these guys, though they don't have too many predators, you have to think that they g might go after lizards or other things that can attack back. So they have to be able to protect themselves. So um, then they are very broad bodied and these guys are made for soaring. They are the expert soars and they have an incredible vision. I believe that it's up to half a mile away they can see. So they are um, experts of, at catching mice in far fields. And what happened to Chitong is she came to us in 1994. We found her in Twisp. Someone brought her in from Twisp. And she, we believe, is a victim of a car hit. Now, t can't totally confirm that, but she was off the side of a road. And um, she had three major fractures of her right wing. And so we decided um, that the best thing for her, for her to ha have a happy life, would be to do a partial amputation. So she has been with us uh, since 1994, and um, she lives a pretty happy life. She uh, is, when I started working with her, she was very skittish because when you are a wild animal and you are missing one of your primary parts, you can be a, a little skittish and defensive. So when I s first started working with her and cleaning her enclosure and such, she was very jumpy and skittish, but after a couple of months of she, we built kind of a relationship and it's been, she's much more calm around me. And then we, every once in a while, we'll play a game of fetch. She'll see that, you know, that I'm picking up trash and I'm raking. And then after I'm done raking, she'll kind of cock her dead, her head down and forward and make it like a little peeping sound. And we'll play a game of fetch with like a mouse or so. And it's just to help with her balance because she needs to be able to, to um, stay balanced with that missing wing. It's actually just a partial amputation. And so she can, she can hop like perch to perch, but she can't really fly and be out there in the wild. So uh, one other thing about these guys is that they are generalists. So they can go after, they're birds of prey, they go after mice and voles and smaller birds and such. But if they ever got in a situation where they were starving, or emaciated and on the ground, they could go even after slugs. So they're capable of eating an array of things. So this is Chitong, and this is our red-tailed hawk. Do you guys have any questions? So she's about 22, 23. And if, if you look, you guys won't be able to see, but if you look close to her eyes, you see little white specks in her eyes, and that's just a natural sign of aging. So usually, um, on average, I believe it's 15 in the wild and 30 in captivity. What? Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and put her away, okay? And we're going to continue on these. We're a little limited with time. Yeah, she was a juvenile red-tailed hawk when she came in. Um, and, of course, we can tell that because of her plumage. Um, I don't know if Alistair went over that, but during their first year of life, their color are a lot more different. Uh, their chest and belly, a lot more lighter color, eyes different color, the sear, which is that skin around the base of their beak, different color, and of course, they don't even get their red tail until past their first year. Uh, so when we got her in, we can tell that she was a young uh, juvenile, and it's actually a good thing that we got her when, that was, when, we, when it was that young, um, if you can say that, because she was able to adapt better to having that wing amputated. Older birds have a lot harder time adapting to that because it puts them off balance. Anyway, so next we are going to go to falcons. Filler. Any questions? No questions? Yes. Yes, the muscles do atrophy when they don't fly, and a lot of these guys don't get enough exercise, and that's something we have to be concerned about. So we really have to watch their diets because if they get too big and they're always on their feet. So excited. <laughs> so this, do you want to do the presentation? <laughs> so
So this chatterbox here is Ishta, and she is a peregrine falcon. Now, one of the things that these guys are best known for, other than being extremely noisy, are being the fastest animal on the planet, or at least one of. In a stoop or a power dive, these guys can go upwards of 240 miles an hour. That is extremely fast. Now, why do they need to go that fast? Because of what they hunt. They hunt primarily other birds. So if you're hunting birds, you want to be fast. So what these guys will do is they'll fly up above a group of birds, pick out one, usually one that kind of seems sick or injured if possible, and then they'll just tuck their wings in and just dive right down after it. And what they do is when they're going after that bird, they will ball their feet up into a fist and literally punch the other bird out of the air. Now, if that doesn't work, and if they're going slow enough, they'll actually try to reach out and grab it. If you check out her toes, she has much more longer and thinner toes than, say, the hawk does. And that allows her to reach out and grab her prey. And if that doesn't kill it, if you look at her beak, she has a little notch behind her, uh, behind the hook in the front. See. Might be kind of hard to see it, but maybe if you look up pictures online later. And uh, that notch also helps her kill her prey. What she'll do is if it's still alive and she has it in her feet, she'll reach down, kind of nestle that notch between the two vertebrae on the back of their neck and give a quick uh, twist of her head and basically sever the spine, sever the neck of her prey. That gives it a very quick death, so. Yes, it's called a tamile tooth, if you want to be technical about it. Um, so these guys have a bunch of cool, uh, cool adaptations that allow them to go that fast. Obviously, they're very sleek, very bullet-shaped, um, but the fluid that coats the surface of their eyes is actually a little bit oily. Now, if you think about it, the fluid that coats our eyes is mostly just basically water and salt, um, which unfortunately evaporates really quickly which you can probably uh, tell if you ever had to uh, stick your face in front of a fan. You know, maybe some of your suitors out there. Or, um, you know, just, just been in like a windy day. You have to blink a lot. Well, if these guys were to blink, their prey would get away. So they don't want to be able to do that. So that oily uh, fluid does not dry out as much. If you look at her nostril, she actually has a point, this little bony point in the center of her nostril. And what that does, that allows her to breathe. If you're going 200 plus miles an hour, that air is going so fast over their face, she wouldn't be able to breathe. So it actually just disrupts the airflow around her nostril just enough to allow her to be able to uh, breathe in. And um, if you look at her face, under her eyes, she has a black color. On her, it's kind of more like a hood that uh, covers her entire head. But on other species of falcons, it is just a black stripe under their eye. They call it a malar stripe. And what that does is it helps prevent sun glare. If you think about it, some humans do that sometimes too. Maybe like football players, baseball players, or anyone else playing an outdoor sport sometimes. And that, uh, again, helps with uh, glare from the sun. So it's basically like a built-in pair of uh, sunglasses. Well, kind of. And, uh, of course, their wing shape. Much more longer, narrower compared to a hawk. We like to say the hawks and really even the eagles are kind of more like the bombers of the bird world. You know, they are not necessarily the fastest, although some of them can actually go pretty fast. Um, but they soar a lot. They glide a lot. These guys are more like the jet fighters of the bird world. They are fast. They are agile. And, of course, they have to be for catching other birds. Now, this one, she came to us in 2004. She was part of a breeding program down in California. And did you folks know that uh, peregrine falcons used to be endangered? Yeah, you were. For several years, they were endangered. A um, lot of different reasons, but mostly due to a chemical pesticide called DDT, which we'll actually get into a little bit later. So she was bred in captivity in California with the purpose of releasing her back into the wild to help you know, boost their numbers. Birds of prey, in general, have a very high mortality rate. So that basically means most of them do not make it past their first year. Some of these birds can be upwards of 80%. So upwards of 80% of these guys will not survive past their first year. So they raise them up in captivity to try to get them past that, uh, that, uh, that troubling point in their lives. So when that happened, something didn't quite click up in her head. For whatever reason, she refuses or does not know how to hunt. 
Now, you would think that'd be more of like an instinctual thing that, you know, if they see a live prey, they would go after it, but I don't know, something just didn't quite click up her head. So she refuses to hunt live prey. If you give her something alive, she just kind of looks at it and doesn't know what to do with it. If you give her something that's already dead, she'll take it right out of her hand and eat it right then and there. So we like to joke that she's a pacifist peregrine <laughs> or a uh, conscientious objector. So, and yeah, that is Ishta, our peregrine falcon. Yay, wow. So Sarvi is a nonprofit, of course, and we take in maybe 2,500 animals a year for rehabilitation purposes. I want you to get the wrong idea that this is all we do, just education. No, we actually get in the trenches and take care of all sorts of wild animals, mammals, birds, and here is our next one, which is what we like to call a not a raptor. And he and and Alistair will explain that. Should I aim her? <laughs> so Aura is a turkey vulture, and we like to call her a turkey vulture because she kind of looks like a turkey. She's got this bald head and that big long beak and she's got long, lanky legs. And unlike all these other guys that we've been showing you, so the uh, raptors, the birds of prey, these guys do not have strong, sharp talons that I have to worry about, right? And the, the ones that will be coming up, will show you they have about 1,200 pounds of PSI. Now, so her big, um, her big tool is not her inner talons, it's in her beak, because these guys are scavengers. So unlike birds of prey, these guys go after uh, dead meat, after carrion, and um, kind of like in the movies where it's a hot, scorching desert, sunny day, and these guys are soaring around in the sky and uh, looking for food, that is what a turkey vulture is. So there's a couple other things that, that make these guys special from the raptors. Now, um, I don't know if you can see with her wings out, but she's got this beautiful iridescence. And then um, she does not have a vocal, cord, a vocal box, so she can't make sounds like Ishta is making, like who he is making right now. She can't make mating calls. All she can do is um, hiss and grunt, and that is, that's a defense mechanism. Now, another defense mechanism that might, uh, a lot of people don't like turkey vultures. They think they're gross. They think they're, they're dirty, which they're actually not, and they actually have a lot of uh, good use and th I believe that they help us quite a bit. So I'm gonna explain that. So th another thing that kind of makes them not look so pretty is that um, another defense mechanism is that they will throw up. So if a turkey vulture is feeling threatened, it will, it will vomit in, in hopes to distract whatever is going after it. And it's kind of like a lizard, you know, when a lizard is being chased and it drops its tail to try to distract a predator. So that's just a defense mechanism. Now, um, Aura, you can see, I'm gonna say this just because her wing is spread out right now. You can see that she is missing a layer of flight feathers and she's got a couple of feathers here that are mangled and twisted and they fall out. And what happened is we got her in 2011 and we found her off of Highway 9, um, actually close to our center. And we got her as a juvenile, so she wasn't even a year old. And we found that she had a fungal infection of her feather follicles. And uh, we treated that infection, but her feather follicles are permanently damaged. So she's showing you guys that she's got bad flight feathers, and so she can't be a normal turkey vulture and soar way up in the skies. These guys love catching thermals, so they are, they will soar for miles at a time with barely flapping their wings. And um, 
she's also showing us a good example of the difference between a turkey vulture and an eagle. So sometimes, these guys are actually migratory, so they come through Washington State during the spring and summer, and a lot of Washingtonians say they have never seen a turkey vulture. Well, I have a few times thought I saw a turkey vulture, but it was actually an eagle. So turkey vultures have a two-toned underwing color, right? So she's got that gray and black, whereas an eagle will be all solid black. And when these guys are flying and soaring, they will put their wings out in a V shape and they will bobble, bobble, bobble left to right to help with retaining buoyancy. So you see that she has this great nostril. It's okay, Aura. Here. So you see that she has that, that hole in her nose. She's actually been told to have um, one of the most complex olfactory systems in the animal kingdom. They can sm smell up to a mile away. And an interesting fact is that the chemical that is released in uh, dead meat, that smell, is also uh, gas companies use it in pipelines for natural gas that does not smell. So if there's a pipeline leak, there have been times when turkey vultures will flock around a pipeline leak, so they can actually be useful. Another thing is that these guys might eat dead meat, and that might be gross, but they are pretty much immune to anything that might be growing bacteria-wise. If it is like rabies or whatever it might be that could get to your cat or get spread across the community, their stomachs have an extremely high acidity level. And so they can, they got no problem with it. Another thing is that uh, you see that her feet kind of have a white coat on them. And that every once in a while, she, she will put down her urates, and they're also very acidic. And so they keep her uh, feet clean. And you can see that she's, she's bald for a reason. It's to protect her, her head. If she had feathers up there and she was going after some meat, you could imagine that she would be having a hard time with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and put Aura away, but all I have to say about her is she is super sweet. She's very curious. Um, and uh, she loves like, if I have a coat on, she'll, she'll grab the zipper and zip it up and down and pl pluck at the buttons. She'll pluck at my tattoo. And she's, she's really, really curious. But unlike, unlike turkey vultures in the wild that we actually get into the center, so she, we, tried to rehab and her and we were not able to. With other turkey vultures, when they're wild, they are not as kind and happy as Aura, and they'll actually go after your skin and grab the skin on your arm and twist, and it doesn't feel very fantastic. But Aura has been with us since 2011. She's been enjoying her life. So I'm gonna go ahead and put her away. Hopefully you guys have a better appreciation of turkey vultures now. All right, so we are going to go on to this noisy bird here, which requires this big carrier and this thick glove. Personally, I think it's a hummingbird. There we go. Some of you sound like you already know what this is. So we only have four minutes. Oh, no, the big one only gets four minutes. Oh, man, okay, I better hurry. <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs> Looking at her is good enough, right? Just kidding. So golden eagle because it has this golden color on the back of the neck. They are in the booted or true eagle family because they have um, feathers going all the way down to the toes, unlike the bald eagle who stops about halfway. Now, if you look at her head, her head is a lot smaller than a bald eagle's head. And a lot of people will say, especially on this side of the mountains, hey, I saw a golden eagle. And I usually say, mm, you might have, because they can occur over here. But usually what they're looking at is a young bald eagle. So I say, look at the head, look at the size of the beak, and look at the feet if you can, if you have some binoculars. And then you'll be able to tell, is it just a young bald eagle, or is it truly a golden eagle? She came from the Grand Coulee area. And she is actually a very capable flyer. Golden eagles are large for their size, but 
they're very good at uh, acrobatics and, and stuff you wouldn't think that they'd be good at. I mean, it's not like the peregrine uh, doing the dives, although these guys have been clocked as fast as a peregrine. They just, that's not their usual habit, but they can do that dive. Now she is a wingspan of six feet, one inch. She weighs 12 pounds. And a lot of people go, oh, that's like 60 pounds, huh? Yeah, no, nope. And uh, she is going to be with us a long time because they can live in captivity to be in their 40s, 50s, 60s. And she is actually only, how old is Freedom? 20, so she's 19 because she's one year younger than the, the next bird. So I'm going to move aside so you, sh you can see compare the two because we're running out of time and I know everybody probably wants to see the the last bird so sorry oh the golden eagle's name is Hu Iyake Hu Iyake and then everyone likes to just call her for short Hui ah Hui no if she can shoot her poop six feet straight out and I can aim it That? Why? Oh, why is she not releasable? That's very important. She has a malocluded beak. What that means is that it doesn't line up properly. And so what happens is the bottom, is, since it's over to the side, it'll keep growing and goes out and goes out and goes out and gets really long. And it'd be like having a fork or something stuck to your chin and you had to eat with just your mouth and it would be in the way and the bottom curls, and it's just a, it's a big problem for her to eat unless we take care of her. And preening, preening is a major thing that they need to do, and if the beak is not aligned properly, then you know, she can't actually close her mouth all the way. So, um, yeah, that's a big problem. She came in as a first-year bird. Go ahead and bring yours out. I'm just going to keep talking until you're out. And she was starving to death. A guy found her and kind of kicked her. Thought she was a carcass, and oh, it's still alive. So I'm pretty sure you guys can probably tell what kind of bird this is. This is a bald eagle. And while we have them both out, you can kind of see the difference in size, overall size and, of course, the head size in proportion to the body. Eagles have fat heads. But they need to have fat head because they're so awesome. Now... Of course, bald eagles are our national bird. And uh, as Kestrel mentioned, these guys are part of what's called the sea or fish eagle family. So typically, you will see them near a source of water, like a lake or a river. And of course, they do like to eat fish. They love their fish and their salmon. But these guys, much like the red-tailed hawk, are also generalists. So they will actually eat just about anything they can, especially when they're hungry. And bald eagles are not above scavenging. If something is already dead, maybe on the side of the road or something, might as well take use, make use of it, right? So these guys are not above scavenging. Now, oh yeah, stretch those wings, stretch, 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 there you go. Now while she's flapping her wing, make note of her left wing, this one here. That is why we have her. She actually has a wing injury. When she was about three months old, she fell out of her nest. Now, it's actually pretty common. Um, when bald eagles are three months old, they are actually physically their full size. They're not quite ready to fly yet, but they are their full size. And they go through what's called a branching phase. And actually, a lot of different species of birds will do this. And uh, they start exploring the areas around their nest, hence the term branching. And sometimes, unfortunately, they will fall. Maybe they're a little bit too adventurous. They, you know, try to jump to a branch that's just slightly too far away or something happens. And they fall out of their nest. Um, and unfortunately, especially for eagles who like to build their nest up really high, that typically means that they'll be injured or killed when they hit the ground. Now, thankfully, she was not killed, but she was injured. Both of her wings were broken. We were able to fix her right wing, but unfortunately, her left wing was too badly damaged to be uh, fixed. So that's why we have her. And she's obviously going to be with us in captivity for, us, for the rest of her life. And these guys can live upwards of 50 to 60 years or so. So she's got quite a bit of ways to go. Now, another thing, these guys are called bald eagles, but they're not bald. They have feathers on their head. 
If anything, turkey vultures are bald, as we saw. They don't have feathers on their head. And I'm also bald. So, it is. Um, the word bald used to be B-A-L-D-E, which was an old English word, which means shiny or white. So these guys were called the shiny or white-headed eagle, or bald eagle, because the Europeans had not seen this guy, uh, these guys before. These are only here in North America, so Canada, United States, parts of Mexico. And um, also, much like the peregrine falcon, they were also endangered primarily because of DDT. Um, for those of you who have not heard of DDT before, it's a chemical pesticide that farmers spray on their crops. And unfortunately, it heavily affected a lot of different animals, including eagles, peregrine falcons, and a lot of other birds too. The main thing that it does is when it gets into their body, uh, with them eating prey animals that might be uh, ingesting that stuff, it messes with the way that their body produces calcium which of course is used in eggshell production. So when the birds lay their eggs, the shells are so thin that just the weight of the parents laying on them is enough to crush them. So their uh, eggs were not hatching and you know just a lot of bad stuff. Thankfully though, we don't use DDT anymore. It has been outlawed and these guys have made a really big comeback. So with that, since I only have about a minute left, I um, wanna make sure that you guys do things whatever you can to make sure that there is a future for these guys. What I mean by that, of course, uh, for those of you who are old enough, vote. Vote on politicians and legislature that will help protect the environment and the animals. Um, you can also be a bit more proactive. Maybe if you have the inclination to do so, you become a politician. I know it's kind of a dirty word nowadays, but <laughs> there are still some good politicians out there, um, and you could be one of them. Um, of course, you can volunteer places like Sarvi, like us, or even other places, really, uh, anywhere else that uh, helps promote uh, environmental protection and all that. And um, you can also donate. If you can't donate your time, you can donate, um, obviously, money. Money is always good. Um, but you can do things like even just materials. Uh, us at Sarvi, we have a go through a lot of food and a lot of cleaning materials. And uh, we actually have a list of stuff uh, that we normally take on our, on our website. Um, so without... Uh, with all that being said, um, thank you for coming to see us. Uh, we will be having a booth out there. Um, we have several uh, uh, little plushies, really cute plushies for sale. Um, you could donate, learn more about us, and we'll also have our birds out. Uh, give us a little bit, but we'll have our birds out. And any information that we did not uh, cover or any questions you have, feel free to come up to us and ask.